Amen. I'm going to echo what Brother Jose said. I love what I feel in this house. Amen. If uh, I'm just going to put this out there. If any of you guys don't have anything to do on Wednesday uh, mornings, you should come and be in a chapel service with these students because, I mean, time and time again, the Lord just shows up and moves in a powerful way. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful seeing a generation that's seeking after God. Amen. Come on. I thought I'd get a little bit more amens than that. Amen. I said, I'm glad I've got a, we've got a generation that's seeking after God and his righteousness. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful for what the Lord's doing. Amen. I, I just, I tell you what, I just, I'm thrilled to be a part of this church, this ministry, and I uh, know that God's got his hand on this ministry, and we're just grateful to be a part of it. Uh, Pastor Matt, as you can see, is out of town. I know he said that uh, Sunday, and he is going to be back. So tonight you've got me. Amen. <laughs> Matthew chapter number 27. Amen. We're going to go to the word of the Lord. Matthew chapter number 27. Do keep our pastors in prayer as they're traveling back this weekend. Keep them in your prayers. And then also uh, next week we are going to be taking the school of ministry on their missions trip to El Salvador to join the rest of the school. Uh, the four students that have been there for about six weeks, they are ready for us to come and take them home. Amen. But they are they have been ministering in prisons and uh, different churches, street ministry, street services meeting the needs of humanitarian needs and also the gospel, of course. And so uh, we're excited to join them next week. So be in prayer for uh, us as we go and join them, and then we'll bring them back with us when we come. Amen. Matthew chapter number 27. Just going to read a few verses. At the end of the crucifixion is where we find this scripture. It says, When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own tomb, which he had hewn out in a rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sculpture and departed. And he laid him in his own tomb. We've heard it said many times that Jesus did not need his own tomb because he wasn't planning on being there very long. And uh, he, so, he, so he had to borrow one because he knew that as the first person to ever borrow a grave, probably the last person. I know Lazarus was only in his for a period of time, but eventually he had to go back to it. But how many knows that Jesus never had to go back? Amen. Amen. I want to preach tonight, if you will, uh, on, on, the, on the thought of Jesus borrowing a tomb. We're going to go over several things that Jesus borrowed in his ministry, and you'll see Jesus borrowed many things in his ministry. He borrowed Peter's ship to use as a platform to preach on. He borrowed a young boy's lunch to feed the multitude. He borrowed a donkey to ride on into town, thus fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah 9. And here in Matthew 27, we see him borrowing a tomb. And I'm sorry, media, I I'm, I'm, haven't got to my title just yet. But I, here, here it is right here. I want to preach tonight just on this thought. Don't buy that. Don't buy that. Amen. Because just like Jesus knew that there was something here that was only going to last for a season, so he borrowed it. I believe that there's a message here for the church, that there are some things in life that we have to go through, but if you don't buy into it, it's only temporary. It's not going to be forever. It's not going to be very long, but there's, there, we know that God sends us through seasons of life that are exactly that, a season. But I'm, 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 I'm fully convinced that there are times that when God meant for us to go through just a season because of our own doubts, because of our own, sometimes our stubbornness, sometimes our attitude, and sometimes our unwillingness to yield to the will of God, we end up stuck in this place for much longer than how God intended. And I, I, I want to just, just talk a little bit about this. To purchase or to buy something means to obtain in exchange for something, often at a sacrifice. You see, when you borrow something, it's only temporary. But when you purchase something, it's for good. It now belongs to you. It becomes a part of who you are because you've invested into it. I don't know about you, but I've, I've experienced some things in my life where that, I, that I've bought. And anybody ever bought something and almost immediately had buyer's remorse? 
I mean, you realize that that probably wasn't the best thing I could have done with that money. And, you know, depending on when you realized it and where you bought it from, there's stipulations on if you can take it back and get back what you paid for it and, and all of that. And, and but, I mean, but I've, we've all experienced a bad buy. We've all experienced a, a bad purchase that we knew probably shouldn't have bought into that. Amen. And I I believe in the spiritual, there's something to be taken from this, that there are some seasons of life, there are some things that are brought on sometimes by God and sometimes by the enemy, but there are some things in life that I see over and over again, the people of God buying into it and making it become a part of them when God never meant for it to be always, but it was just supposed to be something temporary in our lives. But because the enemy knows, listen, uh, I just begin to pray about this and, and seek the Lord. And, and I th- uh, this, the Lord laid this on my heart. And I just, I just want to preach just for a moment. Don't buy that. Quit buying things that were only supposed to be temporary. You might be sick in body, but I've got a scripture that says that healing. Come on, somebody. Amen. You might be sick in body, but don't buy that. Don't buy that because the Bible says that healing is the children's bread. Amen. I I still believe the blood can heal. You might be sick, but don't buy that. You might be down and depressed, but don't buy into that depression. You might be bound by fear, but don't buy into it. You might be bound by anxiety or addiction, but child of God, don't you buy into something that is only supposed to be a fleeting moment. If God meant for it to be there, it would still be there, but by our own reasoning sometimes, we make things last longer than why they actually should. Don't buy that. Don't buy into it. Don't buy into the mindset of defeat. I I could go on and on and on and on of examples and different things that we buy into, but just let me place it over there. If God didn't send it, don't buy into it. If it didn't come from heaven, if it goes against this word, listen, if you're battling with joy, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. The child of God is supposed to be joyful. We're supposed to be full of happiness and victory because that's what the word says. And if there's anything that comes in my life to steal that, then child of God, don't you buy into that. That's just something that's trying to get you distracted. But hold on to what God says. Amen. It all you see see everything always starts with just just an idea. We've heard it talked about everything starts in the mind. But because the enemy in hell convinced you into buying into that idea, now it becomes a mindset and that mindset allows it to become a reality in your life. Let me put it this way. I'm gonna t- t- let's go school of ministry style for just a minute. Amen. The devil knows that the mind is the most powerful thing. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and 7, this is how powerful the mind is and how powerful our thoughts are. He says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Which means I ain't got to do it. I've just got to dwell on it, think it in my heart, and I've already done it. And that's how God judges us. Come on, somebody. Amen. Uh, one, one preacher said, it's tight, but it's right. Amen. As, as the, whatever is in the heart, amen, whatever the man thinketh, so is he. So the enemy knows if he can get you to think on that in your mind, if he can get you to ponder on it in your mind, he can make it a reality in your life. If you think about it in your mind and you dwell on it, that idea gives it power. And where the enemy didn't have access before, he now has access because I've dwelled on it too long. Because I've thought of it instead of casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. That's what I'm supposed to do. But when I give in to it and I buy into the idea that hell planted in my mind, I've just now given hell the authority to make it a reality in my life. And a lot of the things, if we're being honest, we blame on the enemy. That was brought on by us. Amen. A lot of the things, if we're being honest, we, we, we want to blame the devil for a lot of things. And listen, uh, there ain't nothing good about the devil except that he's a good devil. That's the only thing good about him is he's good at what he does. But he gets way too much credit. He gets way too much credit. We do more to ourselves by allowing it to even get that far. Because remember, he's on a leash. He can only go as far as the Father permits, and we know that the Bible says that he's never going to put on us more than we can bear. So what I'm saying tonight is don't buy into the mentality of the enemy, amen, because here's the deal. If you can beat it in your, in your mind, you can beat it in your life. 
If you can beat it in, listen, if you can beat it in your mind, you can beat it in your marriage. If you can beat it in your mind, you can beat it in your workplace. If you can beat it in your mind, you can beat the addiction. You can beat the fear. You can beat the anxiety. You can beat it all if we can beat it first in our minds. The mind is the, is the battlegrounds where we battle the enemy, not what we do. That comes afterwards. Now listen, I'm not saying that you can, it's a sin to have a fleeting thought. Everybody got those, all right? Every, 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 everybody got those, amen. Even Jesus was tempted with things in the mind, but what did he do? He pushed it down and he spoke the word of God. So I'm not condemning anybody. If you've had bad thoughts come through your mind, anybody that says they're not is going to be a liar. But it is wrong when we ponder on it and we leave enough time and enough space for the enemy to we open the door just enough for the enemy to step in and now we're letting things go that we didn't let go before and now we're putting up with things that we shouldn't be putting up with all because we let it go in our mind and the enemy got access to it. Because he convinced us to buy into something that we should have never bought. Amen. Glory to God. You want to know why Job, I'm trying, I'm trying to get this across in the best way I can, but don't, don't buy into that. You want to know why Job came out victorious? Because he refused to buy into what the enemy was selling. Amen. The only reason Job came out on top is because after everything was done, after everything was over, Job still refused to buy into the mentality of defeat. Even when his own wife said, you might as well curse God and die. You've got nothing to live for. He said, woman, you speak as a foolish child. How can I deny him that's never done me? You know what he was doing? I'm not buying into the lie of defeat. If he takes me out tomorrow, I'm going to leave saying, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever and his praise shall continually be on my lips. I'm not buying into that and somewhere we've got to make up in our minds and get the determination of Job that come what may, I'm not buying into the mindset that the enemy is trying to sell me. There's a lot of people, I believe, maybe even in this house, there's a lot of people that are holding on to things that the devil has tricked you into purchasing. Uh, and if I could just put it in these terms and parallel it this way, he's tricked you into purchasing things, maybe a mindset, maybe an addiction. Uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe defeat in your mind. I don't know what it is. Uh, but he's tricked you into purchasing it when in reality God put that thing on call back months ago he gave the area a allotted amount of time and then God said alright it's time come back but because of our decision and because I gave him the authority and because I gave him access now I'm putting up with it much longer than what I should have but watch this the moment that Job decided in his mind I'm not going to give up on God and I'm not going to buy into that. You never see the devil on his farm again. There, there, there's what? There's What is there? 50, 50 chapters of Job? 50 chapters, something like that? Somewhere around there, 50 chapters. Read to chapter about number three. After chapter number three, the rest of the 47 or plus chapters, you never see the enemy on Job's farm again. Why? Because the devil has nothing that he can do against a made-up mind that says no matter what, come what may, whatever comes against me, whatever opposition I have to fight, if I fight, I'll fight. If I got to if I gotta get in the mud, I'll get in the mud and do what I got to do. But I ain't about to give up on a God that hasn't given up on me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The enemy will come to you just like Job. And he's, uh, no doubt he whispered this in Job's ear, and no doubt he's whispered it in yours. He's come to us and said things to Job like, uh, listen, Job, your best years are behind you. You're done bearing fruit. You're done prospering in the ministry. You're done seeing revival. You're done being anointed. Uh, your kids are done being used. Uh, you're done being used of God. Uh, God's done with you, and he's thrown you away because if it wasn't, why would you be dealing with this uh, that you're dealing with? Amen. Uh, but let me tell you something. Job didn't buy that, and you shouldn't either. I said, Job didn't buy it, uh, and you shouldn't either. Amen. Uh, if we don't buy into it, then the enemy's got no defense uh, against a made-up mind that refuses to give up. Amen. 
uh, really felt the Lord deal with me uh, about this. And as I was praying today, uh, amen, I, I think uh, I just come to tell somebody, I know there's probably a lot of Jobs in this place. Uh, there's a lot of people in this house uh, that you say, well, Brother Stephen, that's exactly, I've lost a lot, and it doesn't look like there's anything uh, that's ever going to be good again. Uh, amen. Uh, and maybe just like Job, you're thinking, uh, how am I ever going to see the bright side of this? Uh, and I've lost more than I can take. Uh, but let me tell you the same message uh, that I believe somebody would have told Job. Uh, Job, if you hold on uh, and you remain faithful to God, uh, the best is still yet to come. Uh, you just thought you were blessed uh, before. Uh, you just thought you were being blessed uh, before all this happened. Uh, but if you'll stay the course uh, and you won't waver uh, and you'll hold on to this old uh, ship of Zion, uh, you're going to get way, way more uh, than what you lost. Uh, I feel like telling somebody in this house, uh, if you don't buy into the lie of the enemy, God's going to bless you uh, more than you've ever been blessed. Uh, God's going to move in your life uh, more than he ever has. Uh, but it's going to come uh, when you put your foot down uh, and say enough uh, is enough. I'm done buying into the lie of the enemy. I'm done buying this thought process. In the name of Jesus, I choose to believe the report of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I can't remember who it was in scripture, huh? but when they were surrounded by the army, huh? God told him and said to look up. Huh? And he looked up and he seen a host of heaven. Huh? And God said, look, huh? there's more for you huh? than there is against you. Huh? I don't know who I'm talking to, huh? but I want to tell somebody listening in this house, huh? there's more for you huh? than there is against you. Huh? God hasn't given up. Don't you give up either. Huh? God hasn't given up on you. Huh? Don't you dare give up on him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to God. Don't buy into that lie. Amen. Somebody tap your neighbor, tell them don't buy into that lie. Come on, don't buy into that lie. I don't care what he says. I don't care what he's told you. Don't you buy into that lie. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me take this thing off. I'm already sweating. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Samson. Samson, Amen. Bible. Let's go look at the Bible, the, the, the story of Samson. Samson, the Bible says, killed more in his death than he did in his life. Amen. Come on, buddy. Amen. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to tell somebody, amen, if somebody could have whispered in Samson's ear, I believe they would have said something like this. Listen, Samson, you might be bound in chains right now. Your anointing has been diminished. You ain't got the vision that you used to have. You ain't got the strength that you used to have. You ain't got the victory that you used to have. But, Samson, if you won't give up on God, you're going to see more in your end. Amen. If you don't buy into that, that lie, God is still able to deliver you from this. Uh, amen. I want to tell somebody, if you choose not to buy into that lie, God can still work on your behalf. God can still work on your behalf. But here's the deal. I wish I could do it for you. I wish pastor could do it for you. But it's going to take you to make up your mind. Devil enough is enough. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. I wonder if we got some mamas and daddies, amen, that would put their foot down and say, you've been coming after my kids far too long. You've been messing with my family. You've been messing with my home. You've been messing with my marriage. You've been messing with my church. But tonight I'm making up my mind. I'm not buying into defeat. I'm not buying into complacency. But I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Maybe there's somebody in this house and you say, Brother, Brother Stephen, now I know. Now I know. Maybe you bought into something a long time ago and you've been stuck with it ever since. Maybe, there's, maybe, maybe it's a mentality. I'm not saying you're in sin. And if you are in sin, get it up to the blood. Amen. His hand is not shortened that it cannot reach. Amen. If it's sin, that's all right. Get it under the blood. It's not all right that you're in sin. But take care of it. Amen. But, but maybe it's not sin. Maybe it's just a mindset of defeat. Maybe it's just a mindset that things are never going to change, that it's always going to be this way. Maybe you're battling with the spirit of fear. Well, the Bible says perfect, perfect love casteth out fear. Amen. There's no room for fear in a child of God's life. Come on, somebody. Amen. 
Amen. If you're bound by anxiety, there ain't no room for that in a child of God's life. I'm not trying to diminish what you're going through. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Amen. He said, if you want victory, come and ask, and I'll give it to you. Amen. If you want it, come and ask. God will give it to you. But you say, Brother Stephen, I realize there are some things that I've bought into. There's some things that I bought into maybe a long time ago, maybe recently. I don't know how long you've had it, six weeks, six months, or six years, or maybe 60 years. I don't know. But you realize that I've got some things in my life that might not necessarily be a sin, but they're things that I bought into that I've been carrying around for too long. Well, let me tell you the good news. If you made a bad trade some time back, God is here to make a divine exchange. Amen. I said, God is here. Amen. Glory to God. And because here's the thing. But regardless of what people say here, we all know nothing is free, right? Amen. I know we see advertisements, this is free, this is free. But there's always a fine print that comes in. Come on, somebody. Amen. I know I'm the only one that's fell for it. Amen. But we, 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 we do. Even though we know it's probably not true, we can't help but just click on it. Because what if it is this time? Right? Amen. Well, that's exactly what the enemy does. Every single time he offers something, there's always a catch. There's always a catch because, listen, nothing is free. So, so, so when you bought into something, when you bought that, it cost you something. When you bought it, it cost you something. If you bought into depression, I'll tell you what it cost you. It cost you your joy. When you buy into anxiety, it costs you your peace. When you buy into addiction, it'll cost you your anointing. When you buy into bitterness, it will cost you your victory. When you bought into complacency, it'll cost you your ministry. When you bought into sin, it'll cost you your freedom. And the list can go on and on and on and on and on. Amen. Uh, and maybe some of us in here, we've been going to church. Maybe you've been going to church for a long time. Uh, amen. But you ain't, you ain't got the joy that you used to maybe so long ago. Uh, amen. That's because somewhere you made a bad trade. Because somewhere along the lines, you bought something you never should have bought. Maybe you've been battling with fear. I don't know. Maybe you've been battling with addiction because you bought something, and because you bought into it, it cost you something. And now you've been going without, and maybe you're here, and you've been going for years and years and years and years, realizing that way back when I made a bad deal. I made a bad deal. But you want to know, I just encourage somebody in here, do you want to know what I do when I realize I bought something that I don't want no more? Amen. I just take it back. I, I, I just take it back. Amen. But, but, but how many knows it's not always that simple, right? Right? It's not always, you, you mean, I heard a lot of amens. You've tried that before. Amen. Sometimes, I, I, I promise, sometimes when my, mom, my, when my wife goes shopping, she comes back and I'm like, you know you're going to take half this stuff back. You're going to get buyer's remorse, and you're going to go, and you're going to take half of it back, and you're going to squabble with the lady because she don't want to give you your money back, and she wants to put it on the gift card, but you want the cash that you gave her for it. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> That's because of this thing called a return policy. Let me tell you what a return policy is. It's return policies. Listen to this. It's the the rules the seller establishes to manage the process by which customers return or exchange unwanted merchandise that they have previously purchased. Most places put stipulations on when your return is acceptable, when your purchase is acceptable for a return or a refund. That's what a return policy is. There, may, 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 and, that, and I feel like maybe there's, there, there's, I don't know if there's any prodigals in this house, but if there is, let me just tell something to you prodigals. If you might be in this house or listening live, wherever you're at, if you find that you, the enemy's whispered in your ear and said, you know what, you done been gone too long from the Father's house. You been, you, you, you done did wrong way, to, way, way too long ago. You had chances to go back, but you didn't. Now you're stuck here in the hog spin, and there's not even any room for you at the Father's house. 
The Father's forgotten about you and he don't want you no more. Let me tell you, that is a lie from the pits of hell because ever since the day you left, I'll tell you where your father's been. He's been standing on the front porch wondering, is this going to be the day that my son comes back home? Is this going to be the moment that he finally realizes you done made a bad mistake? You made a bad trade? But if you'll come back to the father's house, I still got a ring that I can put on your finger. I still got a robe that I want to clothe you in. Just come back and make an exchange. That's what the Father says. Just come back and make an exchange. Amen. But when we say, well, Brother Stephen, it isn't always that easy, amen, uh, because of, you know, the, the return policy. I've had it too long, or, or maybe I don't know what your situation may be. But as I was looking into this, I found what is called, and this actually exists, it's called a generous return policy. Anybody ever heard of that? I never heard of that either, amen. A generous return policy. And when I was studying, I seen that, I was like, oh, i got to click on this and see what that says. And let me just read you what I found on a generous return policy. It says, this refund policy permits the purchaser to return the product at any given time regardless of the length that they have had it or the reason for the return and will receive a full refund for whatever it costs them with no expiration date. Hallelujah. Let me tell you a little bit about God's refund policy. It looks a lot like that. He's a, I don't care how long you've been. I don't care what you've done. Just come home kind of God. That's the kind of God. Thank God several years ago when I found my way and I looked up and I realized I was stuck in a hog spin. Thank God that he's got a return policy that says just come down to the altar and we'll make things right. I'll give you back everything that it costs you. And he can do that in this house tonight. Hallelujah. He can come back. Amen. If I could give somebody to come to the piano, I'm going to try to wrap this up. Uh, I don't know if you, any any oldest siblings in the house? Oldest siblings, come on, raise your hand. Join with me. Amen. All right, we got a bunch of older siblings. I don't know how you, how you conducted being an oldest sibling, the oldest, but if you did it right, if you did it right, Amen. You probably con your younger siblings and there's plenty of stuff. You know, the younger, more gullible ones, then they get older and you realize I can't do that anymore. And, you know, goodbye to the sweet old days. They're like, no, 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 you, I'm too smart for that now. But back when they, I'm the oldest of five, and back when my brothers were, you know, younger and more gullible, Brother Wesley, I could talk them just about into anything I wanted to. Amen. I mean, I just, I just had a way with talking. That's when my dad said, yep, you called to preach. Amen. <laughs> You can talk somebody into anything. Amen. I was like, all right. <laughs> but I don't know if you ever did this, but there, there were anybody ever make a trade with your siblings that you knew was not a 50-50 trade? I mean, I mean, they, they, they had something that you wanted, and, and, and you wanted it, and it was cool, and, and you, just, you just had to have it. So, so you know what we do. We go and find something that's pure trash, and we come and we build it up. And we, oh man, oh man, you, you, oh, you should want one of these things right here, I tell you. And we, man, we just, we, we put a sales pitch. Is, am I the only brother that did that? Please tell me no. Amen. <laughs> Raise your hands, put the camera on. I want my brothers to see it. Amen. <laughs> it wasn't just me. <laughs> but, you know, uh, we, 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 I'd convince them, try to hurry this up, get us in these altars, but I'd convince them, and sure enough, they, they'd make the trade. Something valuable for something that was trash, thinking they got a good deal. But you know, no matter how good I sold it, it didn't take them long to realize I made a bad trade. And you know what they did? They come back and I want it back. That was a bad trade. I want it back. And if you was the older brother I was, I said, you done traded it. You stuck with it. That was your fault for being gullible, you know, whatever. And that's exactly what we do. And many times the enemy, that's exactly what he does. He puts something before us, convinces us, convinces us that we need it, and so we take it and we didn't realize that it cost us something that's way more valuable than what we gained. And I come back and I say, I want it back. I want my joy back. I want my peace back. I want my anointing back. I, I want... I just want it back. He says, I'm sorry. 
you done traded it away. Same spot my younger brother was in. But you want, you want to know what my younger brother would do next? Is he'd go straight to dad. And he'd begin to tell him the whole story about what I traded for him. And my dad knows exactly what it was that I did. So you know what he would do? He'd, 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 he'd come and hunt me. Stephen! Uh-oh. Stephen not here. Come and find me. Sometimes if your dad did anything like this, grab me by the shirt collar, yank me around a little bit, bring me around and say, all right, you know what you did. He wants it back. Now give it to him. Give him everything that, he, that you took from him and don't mess with him again. Can I tell you that we've got a heavenly father that'll do that exact same thing every time? You say, well, 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 I've been stuck with this for a long time, and, and I went to the enemy, and I said, I want it back. And hell whispered back and said, sorry, sucker, you're stuck with it because you bought into that. You knew the risk. You knew I was a devil, amen. But all it takes is a cry to the master uh, and what the enemy does. Uh, i tell you what God does. Uh, Jesus Christ steps on the scene uh, and yanks the devil by the collar, uh, brings him to an altar, uh, and says, all right, now give him back uh, every single thing. Uh, whatever it cost him, uh, give it back to him. Uh, I don't want to hear about it no more. Listen, if you've made a bad trade, let me tell you that the Father is in the house tonight and he wants to make a divine exchange. You can get your peace back. You can get your hope back. You can get your joy back. You can win back your family. All it takes is going to an altar and saying, God, I made a mistake. But if you'll take it back, if you'll take it back, I made a mess of what I traded for. I made a mess of it. It's, I know it's not much. My life is messed up. and I still love to, to think about the, we were on tour just a couple years ago. We was in California and we got a phone call. We were on a Sunday morning. A couple years ago, this last past March, we was in California headed from one location to another got a phone call from Brother Matt. He said, how's the service? I said, man, it was good. We had a good service. I said, how'd your guys' service go? He said, oh, man, we had a good one. He said, there's a young man that walked in the door by the name of Caleb Green. Before the altar service was even hardly called, ran to the altar. He said, let me tell you, if anybody got saved, this young man, he said, I don't know who he is. He knows who he is now. Amen. <laughs> he knows very well who he is now. You want to know what happened on that day? A young man woke up and realized, I made a bad trade, and I want it back. <laughs> Every single one of us has that story. But maybe there's somebody, and I believe there is. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. I believe there's somebody in here. You say, Brother Stephen, I'm in a predicament where I've made a bad trade. Maybe you've, maybe, maybe you've, you, 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 you've walked away from God and you've sinned and you need to get your salvation back. It's here. But maybe it's not just salvation. Maybe it, like I said, it's a mentality. Maybe it's, maybe it's your hope. Maybe it's your discouragement that's beating you down and it's stolen your joy. Whatever it is, can I tell you that what God did two years ago for this young man right here, he'll do for you uh, if you'll come down and say, listen God this is what I got. I got, I made a mess of it and long time ago I made a bad trade uh, in one instant heaven can intervene uh, and make a way for you because that's what my father does I, I gotta hurry hallelujah oh I feel the Holy Ghost in this house I don't know who I'm talking to but somebody in here you have been satisfied, maybe not satisfied is the right word, but you've tolerated a bad trade for way too long. You should have brought that thing down to an altar and said, God, here it is, and I want my stuff back. Long time ago. Let me tell you, I, I looked up, I'm closing, but I, I looked up reasons for why somebody wants to return an item. And out of the few reasons that they listed, and it, it just, I got all kinds of excited. I'm in my room praying and studying, and I, I thought, you know what? I wonder why people usually bring stuff back. So I just Googled, why do people usually return stuff? Let me just, let me just tell you a couple of the answers. Is that all right? The first one that I read says they take something back, maybe clothing, because it just doesn't look good on me. 
Child of God, can I tell you that addiction don't look good on you? Depression don't look good on you. The spirit of fear that's got you trapped and got your anointing diminished and got you got your calling held back and all of heaven, that don't look good on you. You can come make an exchange. I got to hurry, man. No, no, number two was the reason they bring stuff back is because it, they, they were met with unfulfilled expectations unfulfilled expectation. You see, when I got this, I thought that it would fix my problem. I thought this was what I needed. I, I thought this is this was going to be the answer. But after it's all said and done and the smoke is cleared, I realized I've still got a longing and it doesn't work. The thing that I traded was the answer that I was looking for and I didn't even realize it. And now maybe you're in this house and you're met with unfulfilled expectations. That the thing you traded for just ain't doing what you thought it would do. Come, get an exchange. Amen. Not too long ago, we were, we were on tour last, last year, I believe it was. Last year. We were at a service in Ohio. and God started moving. There was a lot of homeless people that came in, a lot of people off the streets. And on the way to one of them, one of the guys that were driving a van, picking up some people, just happened to cross somebody and said, hey, where are you going? He said, man, I'm just walking. He said, you want to go to church with me? The guy said, sure, why not? I'll give anything a try at this moment. We didn't know it, but he was a drug dealer. He picked him up, brought him to the altar, brought, brought him to the church, and before that altar service was over, that man done found him an altar. He prayed through the salvation, and before it was over with, I walked down, he's, he's empty in his pockets. He laid a cigarette there on the box of cigarettes there, pulled out another pocket and it was a deal of drugs. He laid that on an altar and just, just multiple things he laid out there, emptied his pockets, walked away. I walked up and said, man, what you doing? I knew what he was doing. I just wanted to hear what his answer was. You know what his response was, Brother Caleb? He said, I found something better. <laughs> I found something better. <laughs> Glory to God. Number three, why they return something. I'm closing said, because number three was because it's, I realized I no longer need it like I thought I did. I no longer need it. I don't care how big of a picture the enemy has painted of what you traded in for, of what you bought into. But child of God, you don't need it. You don't have to have it. I know maybe, maybe there's someone here, you're bound by addiction. You ain't got to tell me. God knows, but you don't need that. Whatever it is you're bound by, whatever it is you're, whatever, whatever it is that's got a hold of you, let it go. Let it go. Give Jesus a try. Amen. Give Jesus a try. Number four, and I'm closing with this. Everybody stand all across this house. Number four, and when I saw this, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I shouted a little bit in my own room by myself. Because when I read across number four, my heart leaped. And number four of why would you want to trade and come and bring something back? Number four simply said, because I found a better deal. Amen. I said, I found a better deal. I've got a scripture verse for you. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You want to know what was going on this morning in chapel service? Uh, they was getting just another taste uh, of the presence and the glory uh, of Almighty God. Uh, and some of them got up, uh, tears all across their face. Uh, they don't went into an hour and a half of class. Uh, amen. Uh, but they got up. You know what they were saying? Uh, somebody talked about being a vessel that she needs to be filled. Uh, well, they got up rejoicing, uh, saying, I've tasted uh, and I've seen. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that he's good. Uh, I said he's good. Uh, he'll be everything that you need. He's everything that you could hope for. Just give Jesus a try. Just give Jesus a try. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm, I, I feel the Holy Ghost dealing right now. Holy Ghost. Help us. Say, Brother Stephen, I realize I've made a bad trade. 
uh, maybe it was some time back, maybe it was a long time ago, maybe it's just recently that you bought into something you knew was only supposed to be temporary or better yet was never supposed to be there. But the enemy convinced you into buying into it. Well, God sent a preacher here tonight to let you know you don't have to keep it. You don't have to stay in it. You don't have to deal with it one more day. But here tonight, he's ready to make an exchange for you. He's ready to make an exchange. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask if that's you, you say, preacher, I bought into something that I need out of. I need to make an exchange. Maybe it's sin. Maybe it's not sin. Maybe it's just something that you're struggling with, a lifestyle. Maybe it's a, a mind battle. I don't know. But you say, I bought into something, and I want to take it back. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? Amen. Yes, yes, yes. God sees these hands. Hallelujah. Oh, there's many hands going over here, but I believe there's some more. Say, I don't want to lift it because what if somebody sees me? What if I'm embarrassed? Are you fed up with it enough to know that whatever it takes, I, I got to get rid of this tonight. I've got to shake it tonight. I can't live one more day with it. We'll see. All right, I'm going to ask you tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost right here. I'm going to ask you if you raised your hand or if you didn't and you should have, if you'll come down to these altars, come on, if you would come. I believe God's going to move on you right now. Amen. Yes, come on, brother. Amen. Come on, if you didn't raise your hand and you realize I bought into some stuff, I've, 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 I've become complacent in my life and my family and my home, but I want to take it back tonight if you're not. Hallelujah. Come on, God's here to meet you. Yes, come on, there's more. God's going to meet with us here tonight. I believe there's some people that's going to leave with their stuff back. There's some people that's going to leave having got back what they lost all that time ahead. Come on, as they begin to sing, could the church gather around? Can we find a place to pray? Can we come pray for our brothers and our sisters? Come on, come on. We need some prayer warriors. 